Our next speaker has the most refreshingly brief bio I've had of the day. Clayton Brown is an assistant professor of history at the Uinta Basin campus. Let's welcome Clayton. Okay. Is this on? Okay. <laughs> there is more to it than that, but yeah. Um, so I'm an I'm a prof assistant professor of history and Asian studies in Vernal. Um, I'm interested in uh, wedding uh, gaming and education, educational games. And it all started with my 11-year-old year old daughter who is way into gaming, and she always has her iPad with her. And I noticed, of course, sometimes she's playing sort of those mindless games. But I noticed she also really likes playing uh, educational games. She plays a lot of math games. And it's not because we make her, it's not an assignment or anything, she just loves to do it. She likes to see, she likes to beat her old scores, she likes to see that she's making progress, that she's learning something. And I started thinking, you know, this would be a great thing to be able to bring into my own classroom, especially for my lower division courses where I have a lot of students who are taking history at college for the first time and they think these courses are boring. Um, so I'd like to inject something that's fun, right, but, but still that, that has a point, that has a, a, something educational, educational value. So that's how I got the idea. And then the ETLG grant program gave, I, I got a series of grants through the ETLG program that allowed me to develop this idea and, and realize it. And so I'm, what I'm going to be sharing today is um, two versions of the same game. Some of you may have been in my presentation last year. I'm going to go over briefly, just sort of do a demo of the first game that I developed a couple of years ago, which was for my Modern World History course, which is a lower division sort of introductory level uh, history course. I've been using it for, this is five or six semesters that I've been using it. So I'll show you how the game works. The second phase of this was to take that same game, that same idea, and make it more flexible so that, you know, potentially the same game could be used in any kind of classroom, not just a Modern World History classroom. So in theory, uh, the way the, uh, the, the more, more recent version of the game is going to work is that uh, teachers will be able to author their own content in the game. That is, they can put in their own content, and I'll show you how that works in just a minute. Um, so let me get out of this screen and into Chrome. Okay, so Atomic Jolt is the company here in Logan that helped me. They, they actually did the coding and, and the programming side of it. Uh, I'm a professor of Asian studies and history, so I don't do that stuff. But I oversaw the development of the game and uh, have been deploying it in my classroom, as I said, for the last couple of years. Um, so I'll come back to this. Uh, this is the Atomic Jolt webpage that features the game and has a few screenshots. But I'm going to take you through the game itself, just do a demo, and also sort of talk through uh, uh, how the students have responded to this. And you'll be able to see this as, I, as, as we look at the metrics that we've developed for the game. So this is in my Modern World History course. Um, it's, the, the game is one of the last things they do in the course. If you're familiar with Canvas, I'll scroll through. These are the modules for the semester. All of the weeks, I do it by week. So the last module, before they take the final exam, the week 13 guide, and they have a series of uh, sort of the usual uh, assignments, you know, watch some videos, a documentary, and then they'll play the Masters of History game right before they take the final exam, the week before. Now the game is open for an entire week, which gives them a week to play it as many times as they want. They can beat their own scores, but they can also compete against their peers. So this is an asynchronous competition. Um, as they play the game, it's timed. So the key thing is to lower their time, to beat their peers. And I've set this up in Canvas. So if I open this up, it opens up in Canvas. It's a free Canvas app. It's already available um, for, for those who teach modern world history. Um, so when you open it up, this is the page that, that students see first. Uh, this is the leaderboard, the top 10 times. So the lowest time gets the highest score. And you can see the number of errors here. Uh, now, every time they make an error in the game, it adds five seconds to their score, so they want to minimize the errors. Um, so they, uh, well, let me just open this up, and you can see what the content is. This is the actual game. Once they start, you have a description in this window, and uh, actually on my Mac, it's not, it, it, you don't have to scroll, it just comes up. Um, but there's a short description, and then you're confronted with the, uh, 10 individuals, right? a picture and a name, 
and the students are supposed to select the, the one that's being described here. So while in prison, he wrote the book Mein Kampf. That's probably one of the easier ones, right? So you scan down here, of course, for Hitler, right? If you click on that, gives you a little check, green check mark, lets you know that that was correct. Now you have 24 of the 25 cards remaining. The time is running out here. So far, no errors. Um, so they have 25 individuals that I've chosen that they have to correctly identify. And in order to finish the game, they have to correctly identify all 25, right? If they misidentify somebody, so say they start reading this inspired by Sun Yat-sen, and they think that it, it's Mao Zedong, let's say they're confused, they think it's Chiang Kai-shek. That's reasonable, right? So that's wrong, gets an X, it adds one error and five seconds to their score, right? Um, and it, we still have 24 cards to complete of the 25. So they have to complete, they have to correctly identify all 25 of these individuals before the game is over. Um, if we skip to, I'll just reload this page. If we skip to the, uh, when they complete all 25, when they've correctly identif identified all 25 individuals, for each that they, that they miss, it's reshuffled back into the deck Right, so they have to complete all 25. When they're done, then they'll, they'll uh, have a pop-up screen that tells them their overall time, how many errors they made, and the total score would be four minutes and 58 seconds, just for an example. So that's what they say when they finish, you know, great job, ranked overall, you're on the leaderboard or perhaps not on the leaderboard. But they can immediately start back over and play the game again, right? They can play it as many times as they want, and in the process, they're preparing for the final exam. Now, of course, Modern world history doesn't boil down to 25 individuals, and I'm not suggesting that it does. But some of those individuals, maybe 10 of them, will appear on the final exam. It is, for me, very important that they're able to identify these people by face, right? They, they can see a photo and know uh, this is Chairman Mao or whoever else, that they know the names of these people, that they know the description. And this helps to familiarize them with the people that we've been covering all semester, right? By this point, at the end of the semester, they should know these people anyway, but it's a good way to review before they take the final exam. So that's how the game is played. Um, in addition to the sort of basic, this, uh, this leaderboard here that the students see, I also have an administrator's view so I can look at the metrics of the game. And I can see for each student who played, actually all the students, we have their time, their best time, it only records their best time, the number of errors that they made, and their number of attempts, which is really insightful, right? Because we have the top scores, obviously they played more times, the people at the bottom played once, right? That was good enough and then they're done. They still get credit though for completing the game. So the way I've set it up is in Canvas, when they complete the game, it automatically gives them credit back into the Canvas gradebook. They get 10 points for completing this assignment. All they have to do is just finish it. So a lot of the students just decided to do it once, but you see some of them did it two, six, three, five, and then the, of course those who play it more end up doing better on this, on this assignment, but also on the final exam. Now the way I've set it up is, uh, for those who end up on the leaderboard, the top 10 scores get extra credit. So they get, it's, it's a little bit, you know, three points extra credit. But it's enough that it's an incentive for some. Some of them, I'm sure, would just play this, whatever, you know, just for the fun of it. But, uh, you know, th one student who did it 36 times, uh, 23, so quite a few times, and that correlates really closely with their performance on, uh, on, on the game, right? So the top times tend to be the people who play it the most. These are the people who get extra credit, but again, everybody who plays the game and completes it will get at least the basic credit, the 10 points for completing the game. So that's how this works. I'm trying to think if there's anything else I wanna show before I move on. Um, any questions at this point about how the game works? I'm gonna talk about how the, the next phase of this game, how teachers can author their own content, but at this point, are there any questions with how this works or? Yeah. It took them months, right? It was the programmers, and then I was coming up to Logan to, to work with them in their offices to give them feedback and, uh, and sort of work through the kinks. And then the first semester that I deployed it, there were some bugs that we had to work out also. Still have a, maybe a few kinks, but it works pretty well now, two years on. It took them probably, probably six months to develop it. 
Yeah, and that's what I'm going to talk about in a minute. The, the second phase of this is that we've created a template uh, so that you can go in and, and put your own content into this same game. Because as it is now, I have 25 of the most important, in my opinion, most important historical figures. Not every person who teaches modern world history would agree that you know maybe some of the people I've chosen, they wouldn't want in there, or they have other people that they'd rather have in there. But from the beginning when I developed this, I thought, you know, that, that if we could make this more versatile, if we could make this so that anybody could use this same game and just put in their own content, whether they're in chemistry or physics or math or whatever, uh, this could be useful to other educators and it wouldn't just be useful in a modern world history course or my modern world history course. Any other questions before I leave the Masters of History? Yeah. Uh, it was paid for by the ETLG grants, so it, it was uh, the first time, for the first phase, they gave us a deal with the understanding that we would take it to the second phase. So the first phase was 5,000, and then the second phase was 10, because it was much more complicated at, at the second phase. Um, I think it was still a good deal, uh, just because what we got out of it is, uh, is educational. And it's, it's freeware, so it's something that anybody could, could download. Right now, the Masters of History is available on Canvas. I've published a little bit about this, this tool, so some, some educators are using it. But the, now that we're developing the, the, the Knowledge Masters game, the more versatile game, then uh, it's, it's going to be useful to more than just myself. So let me go to, unless there are any other questions on the Masters of History. Yeah. I mean, does it have to be the answer static pictures, or can they ever be books of video? Uh, that's a good question. We haven't done video. It's, it's possible. At this stage, we don't have the capacity to do video. But down the road, that's definitely something that would be possible. Yeah, at this stage, it's not. Um, let me move to the prototype for what, what I'm calling Knowledge Masters. So the way this works is if I go back to the Masters of History game, and I'll go to the start page. So I've chosen 25 historical individuals. Uh, this is essentially a deck of cards. And we have 25 cards within that deck. So I've created one deck that I use every semester in my modern world history course. The idea with the Knowledge Masters game is that Instructors could download the software, and then they can put in their own content. And I'll show how, how that, that will be done. Uh, so you can create your own cards, but you can also organize them into your own decks. And you can mix and match. So in this case, when you open up Knowledge Masters, this is again within Canvas. When you open this up, then I have a couple of uh, example decks. But let's say you can either uh, create a new deck. You can start from scratch. So if we go into that, here's a new deck. You would enter the title. Let's say I want to make an alternative to my modern world leaders. So here's world leaders version 2.0. Create that deck. And uh, here we can either enter card titles. So in this case, again, names. Let's say, you know, Thurgood Marshall, you know, civil rights person. We can put him in there as an alternative and upload images or drag and drop images here that would correspond with the names that I'm listing. But it doesn't have to be names, right? This could be, card titles could be anything. And the images, actually you could put any kind of images in here that fit, or uh, you, can, you can opt out of either of these. You can, you can eliminate, so you have the description, you have the image, and you have the title for each card. You can eliminate one of those. You can eliminate the image, or you can eliminate the card title or the description. But you still have to have two elements that they match. Does that make sense? So you, you don't have to have an image, but you have that option. So if we're done here, then it's, well, let me go back for one second. So that's creating a new, new deck from scratch. But the other option you have is to import an existing deck. Then you don't have to redo cards that you've done before. So for instance, in my, I have a modern world history deck. But I also want to do a modern East Asia deck, since I teach a course on modern East Asia. And there's enough overlap between the two that I can import the modern world history deck and then just eliminate the cards that I don't want to use. So I'll import. And here on my computer is the world leaders 2.0. I can choose that. And then it imports this into, again, the, the interface for the, for the teachers to, to um, edit decks and cards. So this is the World Leaders 2.0 deck. I have three cards in here so far. 
I can also uh, edit these cards. So for Sigmund Freud, let's say I want to edit my uh, description of him. So you click on this and you can edit that text. Or you can edit the title of the card here. Or maybe I want a different image, so I remove that image and I can here click to either you can drag and drop or you can select an image from my computer here that's, that's uh, already chosen. Choose that and it uploads it. Or I can uh, remove that image, or the, the, excuse me, remove the card, right? Eliminate that card. And then I can add other cards here. Add a new card uh, by putting in the titles or dragging and dropping or uploading the photos. So that's how it will work. Again, this is the prototype. The, mas the knowledge masters game is not ready yet, but the masters of history is fully operational. And so we're thinking this fall that the knowledge masters game will be released uh, to the public and, and will be available. We were hoping it would be, would be ready by now, but it, uh, the, uh, the prototype is, uh, is the, the farthest along we are at, at present. So I think that's everything I wanted to present on this. Any other questions on, uh, on how the game works, either the Masters of History or the new Knowledge Masters? Yeah. Is it all based on a picture, a paragraph in the picture, or other format? Right now, this is how it, how it works. Now, you don't have to do a picture. You could just have them match a description with a title, or you could, have, you could eliminate the title and have them match the description with the, uh, with the image. So there's some flexibility. And it was, you know, somebody already asked about putting video in. Down the road, that's possible. But right now, this is how the game works. Sure. It it's like sure. Mm -hmm. It yeah. Was there a question or just a comment? How do you see by the students? Well, if you call it a game, they like it a lot better than a quiz. Uh, it is. It is. The content is essentially the same, but it incentivizes them in a different way. Then taking taking a quiz seems like you know they're slogging through it and they have to study. But if they're playing the game, first of all, they can do it as many times as they want, which gives room for error. Right, that they can make a mistake, it reshuffles that card into the deck, and they will be confronted with that card again. So they do have to know every card by the end of the game. But it's a lot more fun for them than, than taking a quiz. They get credit for it, and there's the potential for extra credit. So I, I, the, the big difference is not what they're learning. It's not like this is more effective than a quiz, other than I think they're more incentivized to do a game than they are to do a quiz or an exam. Well, I think it's a great idea. I'm just trying to figure that out. For me, for, it's the, the Masters of History game in the World History course. As a final sort of review activity before they take the exam, they do this, this assignment. Uh, they get credit for it, but it's more, again, it's more fun in preparing for the exam, at least for this aspect, you know, the, the world leaders. There's more on the final exam than the world leaders, but this is more fun than just, you know, reading through notes. But it performs the same function, essentially. I didn't do the programming, but I came up with the, the concept, and then I worked with the programmers. To, I had to describe how I wanted this work to work, and then as they were going through this in stages, uh, I gave them feedback on things like the, the color, the layout, and of course, all the content is my own. So the, the images are open source on, on the internet. Uh, they don't, I don't need to have um, rights or copyright to those images, uh, but the descriptions are my own. So I had to write those based on what my students are studying in my course. Did what? The programming? Yeah. No, that was Atomic Jolt. So the, uh, the page that I started on here, it's this outfit here in Logan, they do the programming, and, th and they were paid directly by the ETLG grant. Um, I, was, I was basically the person who came up with the concept and shepherded it through to, to, and then use it now in my courses. Uh, but I didn't do the programming side, that was Atomic Jolt, and the funding side came from USU. Uh, any other questions? Yeah? I, I see that as in my mind as competency-based. If, if, if you can't do it until you've got whatever score or whatever you were at, you can see at-risk students 
if you did this um, as an intern. And uh, those of they who needed to take it 36 times to get mm -hmm. the score, sure. um, would, you know, possibly that for you would have to be a to make them successful. Maybe it's English as a language, maybe it's something else. Right. But I like the idea of midterm and looking at possibly at this. Yeah, it could be an indicator. I mean, it certainly is an indicator of, uh, of student commitment or capability, however you want to put it. Uh, the ones at the bottom here, uh, some, some of them, you know, this person had 72 errors and only played once. Another person with 20 errors uh, that indicates that they're, they're going into this not knowing who these people are. But they completed the game, which means that by the end, you know, this, some person's played this for an hour <laughs> or 20 minutes that they're going to come out of it knowing more than they did going into it. So it would be great to incorporate this uh, in a more regular basis into my course. Uh, I'm not to that stage yet, but, but as, a, as a sort of final review activity, it works really well. But all the students, I don't think I've had a student who doesn't do it yet. All the students seem to do it, unless they, they've dropped the course by then. But the students who are still in the course will, will play this game. Even if they won't do the readings, or they won't, you know, maybe they, they missed the quizzes or whatever, they'll still do the game. Um, it's just a more fun activity, I think. Uh, other questions? Yeah. Um, I love your game, so that's awesome. Uh, thank you for making it. But my question is, what about, uh, can you put your own grades in there? So mm -hmm. if the, the program itself has the capability and, uh, where we can decide how many things we yes. That's all determined by the teacher within Canvas. So you create this, if I go back to the, the prototype here, uh, when you open this up and you have the Knowledge Masters, when you open this up, so this will be like a sidebar in Canvas. You'll click on it, it will open up a page like this, and if you go, so that this is where you author your decks and your cards. But within Canvas, you can also go to Assignments and, and make this an assignment. So when they complete this automatically, when they complete this game, credit goes back into Canvas and you determine what kind of credit. It could be points, it could be uh, some other score like an A or I mean, whatever you want to determine within the parameters of Canvas, that, that is possible with, with this game. It's just an assignment within Canvas. That's how it operates. So I decided it's worth 10 points because that fits the scheme of my course and, I, and I've also designated that they get extra credit, three points extra credit if they end up on the leaderboard at the end of the week. So it's open for a week, they compete for a week, and then whoever's still on the leaderboard, of course you have this scramble in the last hour or so that the game is open to try and make it on the leaderboard or to make it to the top. Uh, but those are the students who get the, the extra credit. So when it comes to how do we know? Is it on Canvas? Can go it it's available through Canvas. The uh, uh, city people uh, would be able to help you integrate that into your course in Canvas. That's who I'd refer you to. Maybe next, since this isn't operational right now, it, it, we're just at the prototype, maybe next year uh, I would do another presentation once it, it's working all the way and then maybe, maybe people would have a better idea that, that it exists and that it would be useful for their courses. So that's a thought. Yeah, that, that's what people said last year when I presented on the Masters of History. I had people in chemistry and biology saying uh, that I, I'd really like to do something like this in my course, which is a, a naturally why we wanted to make this more versatile so that any teacher could use it, and, and not just at USU, right? That potentially this could be used by high school teachers and even outside of Canvas, although that's farther down the road. Any other questions? Comments? Derogatory remarks? No. Okay. Call it good. Thank you.